the next talk is uh, staying with the theme of cobalt cows for fishy tropes, given by uh, Johan den Rajan uh, from Utrecht. Uh, particle size effects and fisher tropes fatalities. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Johan de Breede. I'm working in the group of uh, Professor uh, Krijn de Jong at uh, Utrecht University. Um, and today's work is performed in close collaboration with the group of Professor Anders Holmo from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Sonsjem. Um, so today I'm briefly, I'm briefly going to focus on the Fischer-Tropes um, reaction and then continue with cobalt particle size effects as has been observed by my uh, predecessor, Dr. Bezema. Um, and he used actually cobalt and carbon nanofibers as a model system to study this. Uh, then I will quickly touch upon the Fischer-Tropes mechanism and then continue with the technique which we use to study the origin of the cobalt particle size effect in Fischer-Tropes um, catalysis, which is steady state isotopic transient kinetic analysis. Short. Um, Sitka. So, of course, I will show you the results and then I will show you some activity and selectivity modeling which we uh, used. So, first of all, the V-stops um, reaction. Well, syngas can be converted over the cobalt or iron catalyst to form the desired hydrocarbons. Um, the broad, broad applicability of this reaction can be uh, visualized by the number of sources which can be used to make the syngas. So, you can have natural gas, coal, or biomass, and they all can be used to eventually synthesize the hydrocarbons, uh, for example, which can be used for a uh, transportation uh, purpose. Um, but also the vivid inter interest of industry can be, uh, is demonstrated by a huge number of hydrocarbons which will be produced by hopefully next year. And um, as you can imagine, if you want to make such an amount of hydrocarbons, you also want to optimize your catalyst uh, performance. And actually, uh, that was the study of my predecessor, as I already told you. Um, so this uh, study from uh, <coughs> Rachel And what he did is he varied the cobalt particle size using cobalt and carbon nanofibers as a model system. And actually he observed the following activity particle size um, relation. So here you see the turnover frequency, that is the number of CO molecules converted per number of cobalt surface atoms per second, so in surface normalized activity. First, the cobalt particle size, we see it for large particle sizes, the activity is roughly constant. However, below that particle size of about 6 nanometers, you see that there's an off the sudden drop in activity. And the question is, like, why? What, what happens over here? We can phrase it. What's the origin of the cobalt particle size effect in fission of catalysis? Or on activity. But not only activity is influenced, but also the selectivity is influenced. But before showing that, I will just give a. Um, I'll show you just one picture of a cobalt on the carbon nanofiber catalyst. You see here uh, the fiber structure of the carbon nanofibers, and on top of that, the cobalt particle, uh, cobalt particle size. The cobalt particles. <coughs> so, not only activity, also selectivity is influenced. Here you see the methane selectivity, so that's the selectivity towards the undesired product as function of the cobalt particle size. And then you see basically that for particle size below 6 nanometers, an increase in the amount of undesired product. In increase in the amount of methane. So again, we can ask uh, ourselves the question like, what's the origin of the cobalt particle size effect on C4 um, selectivity? So to, to answer those questions, like, to answer the, the question on what's the origin of, actually we did one step backward. And then we looked into the feast of mechanism, or rather a feast of mechanism, because there are um, several. But in this one, actually, you can discern there are several steps. So there's CO um, activation, then water has to, uh, oxygen has to be removed to form water. But also carbon-carbon coupling should take place to form the uh, longer hydrocarbons. And also hydrogenation steps take place. And uh, actually, when looking at this mechanism, we, are all, we ask ourselves, like, what happens if we change the particle size with the amount and residence times of the feedstops intermediate, being CO, CHX, OHX and hydrogen. Because if we have insight in those, in, in the amount and the resonance time of those feedstops intermediates, then in principle we can use, um, we can describe the activity and selectivity <laughs> just using simple reaction equations, and thereby possibly we can understand um, the cobalt particle size effect. So the question is right now how to determine the amount and the resonance times of those feedstops intermediates. 
And for this, we used um, steady state isotopic transient kinetic analysis. So how did we do such an experiment? Well, we typically used a fixed bed um, reactor. So we had about 100 milligrams of catalyst. And then we performed online GC analysis in order to calculate the conversion. Um, then we did the Fischerop, the um, Sitka reaction, and we typically used a hydrogen CO, CO, CO ratio of 10, and that's basically just um, to facilitate the analysis. All right, then we did the, the direction. We wait till we had steady state conditions, and once we reach steady state conditions, then we make isotope switch. So for example, we make a switch from argon hydrogen 12 CO to what krypton hydrogen 13 CO. Then we wait till we reach isotopic steady state, and once we reach isotopic state, steady state, then we make a back switch. And all those switches were followed with a mass spectrometry. So to just to give you a typical example of how such a um, back switch uh, looks like, so here you see the normalized intensities of the different um, intermediates and different um, compounds we follow. So what you typically see is first the exchange of the inner traces, and then after a while you, for example, see the decrease of the 13CS4 uh, signal and at the same time increase in the 12CS4 signal. Very nice. What do we learn from this? Well, basically what we do is we integrate between the areas of the uh, inner tracer and, for example, the 13CS4 signal. <coughs> and this integrated area gives us the reference time of the intermediate leading towards 13CS4, uh, for example. So we say, like, okay, this is the reference time of CSX. If you then multiply this resonance time with the total exit flow concentration, then we end up with the total number of absorbed species. And if we divide the number of absorbed species by the total number of cobalt surface atoms, then we end up with the surface coverage. So please remember, both resonance time and coverages are obtained from those set experiments. Then actually we have a whole range of um, different um, isotope switches. So we use labeled carbon, uh, labeled oxygen, and the hydrogen deuterium switch in order to calculate the, um, or determine the resonance time and the coverages of CO, CSX, hydrogen, and OHX. Well, as I already said to you, we're using a, a high hydrogen to CO ratio just to facilitate the analysis. But then you might wonder yourself, like, okay, that's very nice, but can you really use this technique in order to explain the cobalt particle size effect for real fish top conditions? Well, just to validate that, I will show here first the turnover frequency as function of the particle size during SIPCA uh, conditions. Um, if you pull on top of that the real fish drops conditions, I will we'll do right now, then you see that the trend matches fairly well. And this is actually pretty interesting because now we have a whole range of various conditions. I mean, either we have methanation <coughs> conditions or we have industrial or relevant conditions at even 35 bars. Still, we see the universal trend of a decrease in turnover you can see below a certain part of the size. So indeed, we can use Sitka in order to study the origin of the cold part of the size effect. So let's move on to the first results. Um, the resonance time of CSX and CO. Those are plotted here as function of the cold part of the size. And then basically you see that the CO resonance time decreases below 6 nanometers. And at the same time, there's an increase in the resonance time um, of CSX. And then this most likely indicates that for small cobalt particle sizes, there's a stronger interaction between the cobalt surface and the CSX intermediate. Well, as I already said, from the resonance times, we can also calculate the coverages. And we will show in the next um, picture. So here you see the CO and CSX coverage, again, as function of the cobalt particle size. And then you see that below 6 nanometers, both the CO and the CSX uh, resonance times drops. Note, however, that during those Sitka experiments, we only observe the irreversibly bonded intermediates. And if I say that like this, then of course we can ask ourselves the question immediately, like what about the irreversibly bonded intermediates? Or are they? So to determine this, we did a kind of CO introduction experiment. And so we made the switch from um, krypton hydrogen towards argon hydrogen CO, and we determined from this initial switch the amount of CO that was absorbed. Let's pull it over here, it's a function of uh, a couple of particle sizes. If we now plot on top of this um, the amount of CO, what was reversibly bonded, so from this previous experiment, we can the, 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 the determine, because if there's a difference, that should the difference should be the amount of irreversibly bonded um, CO. Well, let's do it like this. So in blue you see the reversibly bonded intermediate, 
and now what's left over, so the red part, is indeed the amount of CO which is irreversibly bonded. So what we can conclude from this experiment is like the lower, the smaller part of the size, or at least below six nanometers, there's an increase in the amount of irreversibly bonded um, CO molecules. Then can we say something about where those molecules are located? For this, actually, we used a um, um, statical model from Van Harder van Hartog, published some time ago. And actually, this allowed us to calculate the um, fraction of the cobalt surface atoms with a certain coordination number. And for example, what we did is calculate the fraction of the atoms with a very low coordination number, so the uncoordinated side. And plotted that as function of the amount of, of the fraction of the uh, <coughs> irreversibly bonded CO molecules. And then we see that they have a very nice linear relation, but it's likely indicating that indeed the irreversibly bonded CO molecules are somewhere located on the corner and edge side of small um, cobalt particles. So, so far in the um, carbon content, now let's move on to the hydrogen uh, surface coverage. Um, so, for this experiment, we have a hydrogen deuterium switch. Um, unfortunately, from this experiment, we are not able to calculate the resonance times and also so the surface coverages um, of hydrogen because of the fact that the hydrogen transient and the inner trace transient more or less fall on top of each other. However, fortunately, we do have the formation of HD, and we believe that we can use the HD formation to estimate the hydrogen surface coverage. And um, so we did, as a function of the total particle size, and then we see the following trend. And um, then we see that if you move below 65 nanometers, uh, that we see an increase in the amount of uh, hydrogen present on the surface. And this might actually well hint towards the increase in uh, methane selectivity as has uh, as I've shown you uh, earlier. So let's just summarize what we have seen so far. I mean, I don't have to tell time to dwell on the OHX intermediates, but think, I think you will believe me that um, for co cobalt particle sizes smaller than 6 nanometers, there's an increase in the resonance time of uh, CHX as well as OHX. There's a decrease in the resonance time of CO. At the same time, we have seen for the surface coverages that there's a decrease in the surface coverage of CO, CHX, and OHX, but also there's increase in the surface coverage of hydrogen and the irreversibly bonded um, CO molecules. Well, that's very nice. Now we have trends as function of the cobalt particle size, but now can we make one additional step? So then we actually went back to the feature drops mechanism, and now we try to model the activity and selectivity. So let's start with the activity. Um, for the activity, we have to assume that one of the hydrogenation steps of CHX towards CHX plus 1 is rate limiting. And if we do so, we can describe the turnover frequency as follows. Basically, it, it ends up with uh, 1 over the resonance time of CHX times the coverage of CHX. Well, now we can fill in those uh, variables as function of the color particle size, and then we can try to see what, what comes out and compare it with the real fish drops um, results. So please mind. Uh, that there's no fitting involved at all. So the result of this um, exercise is plotted over here. There's the open uh, spheres, and on top of that, the, uh, the black squares are the real um, fish drops data that uh, performed at one bar. Then, actually, what you immediately see that we have a very nice agreement with this model and the real um, fish drops uh, conditions. So that right now we understand why we have a lower activity for small cobalt particle sizes because we have seen an increase in the resonance time of CSX, as well as a decrease in the surface coverage of um, CSX. Then let's move on to the selectivity, <coughs> and here we're focusing on the mean plane selectivity again. And for the mean plane selectivity, we actually assume that we have two reactions. One is a um, termination step in which um, CH4 is formed, and one is a propagation step in which uh, carbon-carbon coupling takes place. Then we can describe the selectivity as follows. Well, we can fill in and do some, uh, eventually we enter with the folding formula. Um, right now, we do have a kind of fitting parameter, which is the propagation constant over the termination constant. But now again, we can fill in the coverages of CHX and hydrogen, and then we end up with the following <coughs> result. Again, you see the open spheres represent the result of this model. And uh, all in here as well as this is the um, C1 selectivity found at 1 bar and the C1 selectivity found at uh, 35 bars. Again, we see a very nice trend in, uh, or a very nice agreement in the trend that we see an increase in methane selectivity if we go below the 6 nanometers. 
In this case, the absolute values are different, but that's due to either the higher pressure or due to the higher hydrogen CO ratio, as in the case of the um, Sitka experiment. So just to conclude, um, I hope to have convinced you that um, for cobalt particle sizes smaller than 6 nanometers, we see that more of those edge and corner sites are blocked by irreversibly bonded CO molecules. The second thing is that uh, on the remaining terracytes, we also have seen a lower intrinsic activity due to the, or basically what's become concluded from the increase in the resonance time of CFS. <coughs> so both effects will eventually end up at, uh, for, uh, yeah, in a lower activity. We have also seen that uh, for small cobalt particle size, there's an increased coverage of hydrogen, and from that we can deduce that we have an increased uh, methane selectivity. Actually, this work has been uh, published very recently. Um, having said that, I would like to thank NRCC for its travel, the travel stipend, also Shell Global Solutions for uh, financial support, and uh, you for your attention. We have time for some questions. Albert Hall, BBYD. I'm really excited to see these results because they uh, confirm the work of Lee and Bartholomew the, back uh, 21 years ago <laughs> um, when we did some temperature programmed reaction on cobalt uh, alumina of various loadings. And indeed, we found that as you went to very small crystallite sizes, that you got more methane and, and more reversible CO absorption. And in fact, we couldn't dissociate CO on, uh, on the 1% cobalt on alumina with very small particle sizes. Um, there's just one thing I would take issue with. We think that it was and it is an effect of support decoration of the cobalt at the, uh, uh, well, in our case, at these lower loadings on the smaller crystallites. I think it's more likely that you could, with smaller crystallites, get blocking of these sites with support species. Well, yeah, we have, a, in principle, we always say, like, okay, we have an inert support, we have a carbon nanofiber support, so it's not really mobile, I would say. So I wouldn't expect that you indeed get the decoration of your um, cobalt particles with a kind of, I don't know, mobile carbon layer or so on. We found decoration effects for iron and, co and cobalt on carbon supports as well. Okay. And, 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 pu and published those two decades ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another question. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Jerry Spivers from LSU. I wonder about the monodispersity of the cobalt particles. How close to a monodisperse catalyst were you able to uh, develop with this carbon nanofibers? Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, it, it, it depends a bit on the particle size. Um, so we prepared those catalysts. Um, so we prepared catalysts with different particle sizes by varying loading. And actually, so the smallest particle sizes have a very low cobalt loading, about one weight percent. And those have a very small particle size distribution. So it's about uh, I don't know. I don't know about hardly exact numbers, but it's a plus or minus uh, 0.5 nanometers. It's very, very narrow particle size distribution. However, if you go to large particle sizes, so about 60 nanometers then definitely the, the distribution is much, much broader. We have time for one more question. If not, then uh, nope. yes. Bill Hecker, BYU. I like the idea you were able to get uh, absolute values of, of uh, fractional coverage of the different species. However, your, all your works, at, if I got it right, was about 1.85 bar. So what do you expect to happen as you go to more realistic pressures, 20 or 30 bar, those fractional coverages, do you see that they'll change or are they going to stay the same? As a um, pool. I, I would guess indeed that the fractional coverage would increase a bit, but I'm not so sure how, at least I know, for example, now we have a high hydrogen to CO ratio. For example, if we lower